Uh, you can read his particulars in the program. They're most impressive by any standard. I asked him.
found when we looked at every little bitty five millimeter section of artery, we found that a third of the coronary tree, a little over that, was narrowed 76 to 100 percent in cross-sectional area. If you just take a circle and divide it into four quadrants, over three of those quadrants are obliterated, a third of the coronary tree, and then another third is narrowed uh, between 51 and 75 percent in cross-sectional area. <coughs> And very few of these little segments are actually normal. The point is, is that atherosclerotic plaquing is not just a focal process. If you have an artery this long, it's not present just in one portion of that artery, it's present throughout of the artery, unfortunately. Then I hate to show this, this slide, but some of us have a wonderful dinner tonight. <laughs> If you leave a slab of butter out for about three or four days in room temperature, that's about what it looks like. And this is an aorta. An aorta is a superhighway, of course, of our bodies. The blood is pumped from the heart into the aorta, and then all the other arteries come off of it. But this is an aorta opened up and spread out. So that every, every square millimeter of the lining of that aorta is covered by atherosclerosis. Plaque. Uh, and this is what atherosclerosis, the number one killer in the Western world, uh, is all about. Now, as mentioned, uh, what a, I'm a cholesterol person. If cholesterol is, if it is not responsible for this plaque, it is clearly the marker of it. Uh, it may be that it's working, as mentioned earlier, by turning on the clotting process. But if the cholesterol level is low, you don't have to worry about it. Now these are the factors linking cholesterol to atherosclerotic plaque. <coughs> as far as I'm concerned, this, is a, this uh, connection is as firm as any connection in clinical medicine can be. It started actually in the early part of this century by feeding high cholesterol diets to certain non-human animals, namely rabbits, and I'm afraid we've got a lot in common with the rabbit, uh, and produced atherosclerotic plaques similar to those occurring in human beings. And then the uh, chemist came in and, and analyzed these plaques and found cholesterol in both experimentally induced plaques in non-human animals and in the plaques uh, in humans. And then not much happened until after World War II, and, and a man by the name of Ansel Keys and his colleagues went around to various nations on the planet and found that atherosclerotic plaques large enough to produce clinical problems occurred only in populations that had cholesterol levels blood greater than 150. Uh, so if you want to make sure you, would, you don't get a lot of atherosclerosis in your body, uh, that's a good level to shoot for. Now, in the U.S., it's very difficult. When we're born, our cholesterol and our blood umbilical vein is about 75. Within two weeks of life, it shoots up to 150. And then it usually remains about 150 until we're 20. And then it gradually goes up thereafter. If we could keep our cholesterol levels about what they were when we entered college, or the health of this nation would skyrocket. Now one of the reasons that this cholesterol connection is so hot is that items four, five, and six have really been confirmed only in this decade. And that is, the higher the blood total cholesterol level, the greater the chance of having symptomatic atherosclerotic disease, the greater the chance of dying from atherosclerotic disease, and the greater the extent of the atherosclerotic plaques. Number five, came about uh, in January 1984. Lowering the blood total cholesterol level decreases the chances of fatal or non-fatal atherosclerotic disease. And number six, 
at least the best study came in 1987. Atherosclerotic plaques regress when high cholesterol levels are lowered. So in my view, any way one looks at the connection, it's a firm, strong one. It would hold up in any court in any land. Now this is the summary slide of Ansel Keys and his colleagues. They went to these seven nations and examined the number of people, a total of 12,000 in all, and found that certain that people living in certain countries like Japan and Greece had a very low frequency of atherosclerosis, USA, Finland, uh, a great deal. Now most of this data was collected in the 50s. Uh, at that time, as you know, uh, Japan did not have a single bank in the top 10 in the world. Today, nine out of the top 10 banks in the world are Japanese. <coughs> And I think if they're getting more about money, they're going to get more about plaques up here if they're not the careful. Now, Ansel Keys concluded that, that this was a cholesterol problem. In Japan, southern Japan, the group he studied, uh, the average total cholesterol there was about 150, about what it is in you college students uh, today. The other interesting thing, at least to me, is that look at the very small percent of the Japanese population with total cholesterol levels under, oh, over 200. Uh, Finland, on the other hand, uh, which had the highest frequency, uh, had total cholesterol levels of considerably over 250 milligrams per deciliter. Very striking difference. Now this is a study that was published in 1986. Uh, this one cannot be ignored. The reason is look how many people were studied. Over 350,000 individuals. Can you imagine setting up a study of over 350,000 people? These were all men. I'm sorry to admit, ladies, but most uh, studies in hypertension and in atherosclerosis uh, have been in men. Now all of these men were asymptomatic. They had no evidence of heart disease when they entered the study. When they entered the study, they were aged 35 to 57, and they were all divided into 10 groups based on their total cholesterol level. And what this study so nicely shows is that as that total cholesterol goes up, up, and up, the coronary artery disease mortality, and this is a six-year mortality, goes up, up, and up. Six years. So what this shows is the higher the level, the greater the risk. It's a quantity. Simple as that. Now this busy slide summarizes the two studies which have shown beyond any reasonable doubt that if the total cholesterol level in our blood is lower, that our heart attack frequency risk is also lower. Now the one on the left here is the, what is called the Lipid Research Clinic Study. It was sponsored by NIH. It cost 150 million taxpaying dollars. Uh, it's never going to be repeated. We've got to accept it. And this study involved about 4,000 men, also asymptomatic. The study on the right is called is the Helsinki Heart Study. It came from Finland, but it was set up the same way. Again, about 4,000 men. The average age in both studies is 47 to 48. Now, half of the people in each study were put on a cholesterol-lowering drug. The one chosen here was cholestyramine. One chosen here with Jim Fibrozid. Now all of the people in this study went seven years. And after seven years, there was a 19% reduction in heart attack frequency in the group on cholestyramine compared to the group that was not on the drug. These patients, five years, had a 34% reduction in heart attack frequency in those on the drug compared to those not on the drug. These studies uh, have been analyzed in the 
most conservative man any study could be analyzed. For example, if you are put in the uh, group to receive the drug, even if you stop taking the drug after a few months, and 30% of the people in both this study and that study quit taking the drug after about a year, the people uh, stayed in that arm of the therapy, of the uh, study. In other words, the data was analyzed by intention to treat, not precisely by what uh, the person uh, received. Uh, if one looked at each of these studies, uh, comparing patients who stayed on the drug and full dose the entire time, the difference between uh, those receiving the drug and those not was, was enormous, was enormous. For example, in this study, uh, the total cholesterol fell approximately uh, 25% in the group that stayed on the drug. When the total cholesterol fell 25%, heart attack was reduced 50%. Now both of those studies in essence shows this, show this. And that is, if you look at total cholesterol in the blood, for every 10% drop occurs in that level, heart attack frequency is reduced 20% by the Lipid Research Clinic study and 30% by the Helsinki Heart Study. In other words, for every 1% total cholesterol falls, heart attack frequency drops 2% or 3%. Now if you spread that data around the country and drop every American's total cholesterol level by 2%, let's say, we're, we're diminishing heart attack frequency by 4% or 6%. If we drop every American's total cholesterol level by 10%, we're dropping heart attack frequency by 20% or 30%. So low drops can be significant. Also, it's true on the reverse. If we raise our total cholesterol level by 10%, it's not easy, and it's not very difficult to do at all. I mean, uh, it's very easy to do. If we raise it 10%, we increase our heart attack frequency 20%. Now this study came out of Bogalusa, Louisiana. This was an autopsy study. These, the way that these investigators did this study was to take a orders and then open them up and pin them out on a fork board and with a planimetry device, measure how much of the surface area of the aorta was covered by atherosclerotic plaque. And what they found was that as the, this is the LDL cholesterol. This is the, this is the major atherogenic cholesterol called the low density lipoprotein cholesterol. This is the worst one. Uh, as that level goes up, up and up, the amount of atherosclerotic plaque in the aorta goes up, up, and up. So, in other words, if we increase our levels of cholesterol in the blood, our chances of getting symptomatic atherosclerotic disease go up, our chances of dying from atherosclerotic disease go up, and our amount of atherosclerotic plaque that we have in our arteries goes up. Now this slide is simply a title page of an article that appeared in June 1987. There have been three major reversibility studies so far, and what these studies, uh, const the way they're performed is like this. Uh, a, a person will have a coronary angiogram, and a certain number of narrowings are seen in the coronary artery. And then the person is put, well, half of the people are put on a cholesterol lowering drug and the other half are not. And then two years later, the coronary angiogram is repeated. And what has been found is that the people who were put on a drug and stayed on the drug, the number of narrowings diminished. In other words, uh, a severe narrowing became more open. And other narrowings did not get any worse in the drug arm. Now what this says, or what I'm trying to say, is that if the cholesterol level is 
lowered, it tends to prevent further progression of atherosclerotic plaques. And number two, the plaques that are present can be shrunk in size. So even in patients, people who have had a heart attack, uh, it pays to lower the cholesterol levels because that reduces the chance of a subsequent uh, heart attack. Now let me switch gears a moment to nutrition. And I don't claim to be a nutritionist. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I went to medical school, I don't recall a single lecture on nutrition in four years. When I graduated from medical school, I couldn't define the word calorie. I didn't know the caloric content of a single food. I don't recall hearing any discussion on saturated fats, for example, during my four years of medical school. Now this slide summarizes three different studies by three different investigators. Now each one of these lines are, are different groups of investigators, and they all show the same thing. And that is, if we increase our dietary cholesterol intake, the amount that we take in, the cholesterol in our blood will grow up, will, uh, will increase. Uh, and it doesn't happen the same way with every person. One person can eat three eggs and the total cholesterol may not change. Another person can eat three eggs and it'll shoot up. But if one is dealing in groups of 100, about every 100 uh, milligrams per 1,000 calories of cholesterol we take in, it shoots up our total cholesterol of about 10 milligrams per deciliter. So an easy way to raise our cholesterol is simply to eat the stuff. But I don't worry so much about cholesterol. Uh, I don't worry nearly as much about it as I do plain old fat. I think these uh, books, which have to do with low cholesterol diet, I think that word should be changed to fat. And the reason is, is the amount of cholesterol most of us take in is less than a gram, about a half a gram of cholesterol every day. And if we give up the visible and non-visible eggs we ate, uh, our cholesterol intake would diminish by half. If we gave up red meat, uh, most of the other would be eliminated. So we can really handle that cholesterol thing if we want to. Now fat is another matter. In contrast to a half a gram here, virtually 95% uh, of Americans take in over 100 grams of fat a day. Many of us as much as 150 grams of fat a day. In other words, we take in 200 times plus as much fat as we do cholesterol. And when that fat, uh, and, the, and, and the fat is not all bad, uh, some, about a third of it is polyunsaturated, about a third of it is monounsaturated, and then about a third of it is saturated. And the bad one, they're all high in calories, of course, but the bad one is the saturated fat. And if we take in, let's say, 120 grams of fat a day, about 40 grams of that is saturated. And when that saturated fat enters our bodies, what it does is convert into cholesterol. So our biggest source of cholesterol is not the direct cholesterol we eat, but the, but the conversion from the saturated fat uh, that we eat. Now this uh, slide is to point out that, uh, again, that not all of these saturated, uh, all these uh, fatty acids are bad. It's the saturated ones that are bad. And by simple substitution, we can improve our health. We need to stay away from the fatty acids on this side. Good old coconut oil here is the worst thing we can put in our mouth. This is 92% saturated fat. Look at that. Uh, very little monounsaturated, very little polyunsaturated. Good old palm kernel oil is 80. 6% saturated, butter fat, 66% saturated, beef tallow, 52%. These on this side, in contrast, are good for us because the monounsaturated 
and the polyunsaturated, they can lower our total cholesterol levels, or if they don't, at least they have a neutral effect, whereas the saturated clearly raise our total cholesterol levels. Now, there's some evidence today that monounsaturated might be better than polyunsaturated. Maybe our grandmothers knew what they were doing. Now, look at olive oil here. That's 77% monounsaturated. Good old peanut butter is 48% monounsaturated. Peanut butter is good if we use it as a meal, not as a snack. But simple substitution can alter our health. Now, I admit that I don't go to the grocery store very much, but this word saturated does not appear in the grocery store, as far as I can tell. The word is hydrogenated. And what that means, of course, and I'm uh, uncomfortable showing a chemical formula in this room, but uh, as best as I can understand it, hydrogenated means is that all these carbon atoms of the fatty acid have been covered by a hydrogen atom. A monounsaturated has a one double bond, a polyunsaturated a couple of double bonds, but all those carbon atoms are covered by hydrogen, hydrogenated, that's just the synonym for saturated. So when you see it on that food box, don't buy it. It's bad. Put it back. Now let me spend a couple of minutes on the fast food industry. As you know, the fast food industry in the USA is a big deal. It's a $60 billion industry. 20% of all Americans eat their lunch every day at a fast food chain. 13% their supper and 5% begin their day at breakfast at a fast food chain. Now this fellow Michael Jacobson and Sarah Fritchman uh, they went around to the top 15 fast food chains in the USA and they would order a food and they would try to determine the ingredients of the food or drink that they ordered. And they would ask the waiter or the waitress what the food consisted of that they ordered. Most would say they didn't know. And some would go back to the kitchen and bring out those big barrels that the foods came in. And on the outside of the barrel, sometimes the ingredients would be labeled. And other waiters and waitresses would ask, what does that word ingredients mean? And that's about where we are in uh, some of this fast food thing. Uh, now let's look at the hamburgers. The Wendy's Triple Cheeseburger is the corner artery bypass special, folks. <laughs> it, it, it is closely followed by the Burger King Double Beef Waffle with Cheese. Now we are talking about a thousand calories in that one hamburger. And if you take either of those hamburgers and squeeze those suckers real hard, you can come up with 15 teaspoons, not grams, teaspoons of fat in that single hamburger, and much of that is good old saturated fat. Now this word right there is sodium. It's not salt. It's not sodium chloride, it's sodium alone, and in the champs down here, we got 1,200 to 1,800 milligrams of sodium alone in that single hamburger. Now, of course, we've got to have some french fries with that hamburger. You know, a baked potato is one of the best things we can eat. It's about 1% fat, 1%, that's it, but the average is about 100 calories. But if you chop it up and cook it in beef tallow, which most of these do, 50% of that, good old Taco Bell until about six months ago cooked their french fries in none other than coconut oil, 92% saturated fat. Parties can do a pretty good job and can quadruple the caloric count of a baked potato. Another five teaspoons of fat and another 300 uh, milligrams of sodium alone. Now we gotta have something to drink. The Queen is the Dairy Queen chocolate shake large, 20 fluid ounces, and then they've got another thousand calories right there. Another six teaspoons of saturated fat, much of which is saturated, and over 360 milligrams of sodium. So we've got here. Now uh, McDonald's, of course, is the biggest of all of them. I think McDonald's is a, is a fine a company. When they started in 1955, there weren't any doctors around to tell them how bad cholesterol was. Uh, 
I think if the fast food industry is going to change, that McDonald's is going to lead the way here. This fellow John Love wrote a book on McDonald's it's called McDonald's Behind the Arches three years ago. Some of you may have heard this fellow Bill Castelli who runs the Framingham uh, study up in Framingham, Massachusetts. He calls the arches of McDonald's the entrances into the pearly gates. And, uh, <laughs> I, I think he's right. Look at this. In 1985, 96% of Americans ate at one of McDonald's restaurants. 96%. Slightly more than 50% of the population of the USA lives within three minutes of the McDonald's. This is an old slide. McDonald's has served over 70 billion hamburgers and think how many atherosclerotic plaques. McDonald's is the biggest purchaser or killer, whatever your perspective is, of cows in the world. Since they started Chicken McNuggets, they're the second biggest purchaser or killer of chickens in the world. They're the biggest purchaser of the potato crop in the world. Look at number seven here. McDonald's has employed at one time or another eight million workers. This is U.S. Seven percent of the entire U.S. workforce and McDonald's has replaced the U.S. Army as America's largest job training organization. <laughs> McDonald's world's largest owner of commercial real estate. Some people call it a real estate empire, and all hamburger and But this is powerful. This fellow Tom Parker wrote an interesting book. He asked the question, he said, what do we in America consume every 24 hours? Well, about 815 billion calories of food are consumed every day. Roughly 200 billion more than we need. Those 200 billion would feed the whole country of Mexico every day, no problem. In 1988, adults in America reached 60 percent, meaning that 60 percent of us aged 18 and over in the USA are overweight. Three out of every five American adults. Nearly 100,000 cattle are slaughtered in the USA every day, yielding 60 million pounds of red meat. Many of them hanging up there by one leg, weighing 1,000 pounds. And also about 250 hogs are butchered every day, and 4 million pounds of bacon are eaten every day. Bacon is really the fits. It's about 80 to 85 percent is pure fat. Now, if you don't know what it is, make a hot dog out of it, and we in the USA <laughs> eat about 47 million of them every day. McDonald's puts 2,500 cattle on their tables every day. Dairy cows yield 47 million gallons of milk. We eat 170 million eggs every day. We eat 50 million pounds of sugar, an average of 21 teaspoons of peas. Imagine lining up 21 teaspoons of sugar, and that's how much we eat every day. There's zero protein in a grain of sugar, none. Uh, this, the processed foods we eat are just loaded with sugar. They're loaded with salt, and the processing takes much of the fiber uh, out of them. We also uh, eat 3 million gallons of ice cream every day, and there's more sugar and the ketchup for our hamburgers and hot dogs, and there is an ice cream. McDonald's, for example, boasts that they have served in a mountain ketchup equivalent to the entire river basin of the Mississippi River, beginning 100 miles north of Minneapolis and Florida, 100 miles south of New Orleans. So that's a lot of ketchup, folks, and a lot of sugar. And we also eat 10 million pounds of candy every day. We drank 16 million gallons of beer and ale and 1.5 million gallons of hard liquor every day, enough to make 26 million Americans thoroughly drunk every day. We, split, we still smoke 85 million packs of cigarettes every day. We still have 47 million cigarette smokers in this country. Positions are down to 9% of them. I like this comment by William Collins. The carnivorous animals, and I'm afraid we're not one, folks, have an almost unlimited capacity 
to handle saturated fats and cholesterol. Whereas the vegetarian and herbivorous animals have a very restricted capacity to handle saturated fat and cholesterol. It is virtually impossible to produce atherosclerosis in the dog even when a half a pound of butter is added to its meat ration by adding only two grams of cholesterol to a rabbit's chow for two months produces striking lymphatic changes in its arteries. Now suppose we could divide us in this room into three groups. And over on this side, put the pure vegetarians for many years, decades. And on that side, put the meat eaters, which most of us are. And down the center, the ovo-lacto vegetarians. And ask the simple question, what diseases do these pure vegetarians over here not get that the meat eaters over there get? Well, the pure vegetarians, they don't get atherosclerosis. Pretty big problem in this world, Western world in the West. They don't get it. Pure vegetarians don't get systemic hypertension, high blood pressure in America. At least 60 million Americans, 60 million at least, have high blood pressure. Pure vegetarians don't get cancer of the colon, breast, possibly uterus, have also apparently a major effect on prostatic gland cancer. Pure vegetarians don't get diabetes. Pure vegetarians are not obese. Pure vegetarians are not bothered by peptic ulcer, constipation, hemorrhoids, diverticulosis, appendicitis, high hernia, irritable bile syndrome. If we were a pure vegetarian, a gastroenterologist, a general surgeon would be out of business in this country. <laughs> pure vegetarians don't get gallstone or kidney stone. Pure vegetarians don't get osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is a major problem in this country. For some reason, it's more of a problem in women than in men. By age 65 in this country, the average woman has lost 35% of her skeleton. 35%. Why? Because she's not taking in enough milk as the milk industry or, or beef as the meat industry tells us. No. It's not because she's not taking in enough calcium. It's because almost certainly that she's taking in too much protein. And the more protein we take in, the more calcium. And of course, pure vegetarians are not bothered by salmonellosis and trichinosis and all these toxins and the pesticides and our meat. Now suppose we can look at this problem of meat eating, not from the standpoint of ourselves, but from the standpoint of the planet. If we, five billion human beings on the planet, were pure vegetarians, what would it do to the planet? Well, first of all, there'd be no starvation. It's predicted, uh, estimated, that the USA could, uh, alone could feed 25 billion people. If the food that we grew went for human consumption rather than livestock consumption. Most, over half of the crops grown in this country are not consumed by people, they're consumed by livestock. 95% of the oak crop in this country is consumed by livestock. 80% of the corn crop is consumed by livestock. And uh, the animals uh, that we eat uh, put in those uh, feedlots for the last two to six months of their lives and given 22 pounds approximately, apparently, of grain every day so they can get fat so we can eat them, so they can kill us. And it's a, it's a vicious sight. Now, the animal killing in this country is, is a major problem. There's never been a society like Americans to kill animals. Now, we kill in this country 9 million animals every day. And that doesn't include the 1 million that are killed by motorized vehicles on our roads, so it totals about 10 million a day, or 3 billion every year. Uh, 
I just saw in a magazine the other day a little, little puppy dog. That's a delicacy apparently in China. If somebody walked into my house and wanted to kill my dog or <laughs> to eat, uh, my dog's the best mammal I know on this planet, actually. Uh, but it is a problem. It is a problem. Uh, fear of shortages. Some people think, you know, these livestock got to have grazing ground. If we didn't need so much grazing ground, maybe there wouldn't be so many skirmishes between nations. Soil erosion is getting to be a major problem. It's my understanding that the amount of topsoil in the USA 80 years ago was 21 inches. We're now down to 6 inches. 6 inches. Why? Because we're growing all the crops, the wheat, the grains, to feed the cows, to make them fat, so we can eat them, so they can kill us. And we're destroying the land, that is the land that we have uh, in doing that. The destruction of the rainforest is a problem. You know, the oxygen we breathe is not automatic. We need these trees out there. We need the rainforest. Where does this hamburger meat come from for the fast food industry? It comes primarily from Central America. They're starving to death down there, so we can have our hamburgers up here. In Central America since 1960, the rainforest apparently has been devastated to the extent of dropping from 130,000 square miles to 70,000 square miles in a period of less than 30 years. And the number of species lost by so doing is, uh, is incredible. The Amazonia, the Amazon, you know what's happening to that place. Half of the oxygen on the planet apparently comes from Amazon. The water supply is a mess. It's my understanding that over 50% of the pollution of our rivers and creeks and streams and lakes is due to pollution of livestock. The excreta of a cow is 16 times that of a human being every day. When we put all these livestock in these feedlots, how do we get the excreta out of there? It goes into the water. It's a major pollutant, much greater than industry in this country. There would be no energy crisis if we didn't uh, if we weren't a meat-eating society. We'd all be rich, uh, rich, rich if we weren't a meat-eating society. Now this slide came from the Harvard School of Public Health. It shows a relationship between body weight, shown on the horizontal axis here and here, in women uh, and in men, to what they call mortality ratio. Now that's simply a fancy way of saying when we die, now we're going to all die, of course. It's just a matter of when. But if you want to die sooner than later, it's easy. Just gain weight. Whether you're man, whether you're woman. The more we weigh, the sooner we die. Now, it, this is, I'm six feet tall, 72 inches tall, and my number is 170. So in my house, we got some good scales. Uh, not those little bathroom scales that rust out and they're not very accurate, or at least I never believe it. But these are good scales in the kitchen with a mask on them, and the scales are right next to the refrigerator door. It's right there. <laughs> so when I'm in the kitchen, I get on the scales, and if it's over 170, I'll open the refrigerator door. And I think all of us have got to have a number that we are willing to live by. Now this slide is not atherosclerosis. Now, this slide is not systemic hypertension, but it could be. This happens to be cancer of the breast, a major problem in women in this country. Why am I showing it? Because what we see in this slide is the uh, uh, frequency of death from cancer of the breast, shown in the vertical axis here, to the amount of fat Soon, shown here in the horizontal axis. And what this shows is as the amount of fat that we consume goes up as a society, the frequency of carcinoma of the breast goes up. And here we in the USA have one of the highest frequencies of carcinoma of the breast in the world because we take in so much fat. Now, this slide could just as easily be atherosclerosis. It's the same curve. The more fat.
that we take in, the greater the frequency of atherosclerosis. It could be systemic hypertension, high blood pressure. The more fat we take in, the greater our blood pressure goes up. It could be cancer of the colon, same curve. In other words, if we start the decreasing the amount of fat we take in every day, we're not only going to make a huge dent on atherosclerosis, on hypertension, but also cancer. Now we got a lot of competition out there. These are the National Dairy Council, American Egg Board. Uh, these are the people that are advertising every day. Eat our products, eat this fat, eat this fat, and develop atherosclerosis and hypertension and cancer. Uh, we grew up on this stuff. It's hard to change our habits. These are some of the phrases of the marketing phrases of, of only one of them, the National Dairy Council. Milk does a body good. Stay slim Sunday, sure. Nature's most perfect food, milk. Drink three glasses of milk a day. Milk, the fresher, refresher. Everybody needs milk. Everybody needs milk. Well, uh, there's no... The only good milk is skim milk. Now this is a slide it took World War II to produce. Uh, World War II, of course, 1939 to 1945. And as you know, in certain countries on the planet during World War II, uh, this one shows Scandinavian countries, uh, there wasn't much uh, milk around. There wasn't much red meat around. There wasn't much butter. There wasn't much cheese around. And what happened to the cardiovascular death rate during World War II? In Sweden, boom, it fell. In Finland, boom, it fell. In Norway, boom, it fell. In the USA, it just kept on going. Now we can drastically change our health, but we've got to be very careful what we put in our mouths. I used to say that it was the person in the kitchen determining our health. I don't think that's true. I think it's the person who is doing the shopping that is determining the health of the nation. Uh, I simply show this slide to point out that uh, this is not close. Uh, that reversibility of these atherosclerotic plaques is feasible. If you have lipid in an atherosclerotic plaque, it is completely reversible. In other words, it's like a vacuum. You can go in there and suck that lipid out if the cholesterol level in the blood goes way down. And one of the physiologic principles of blood flow is that if you take an artery and divide it into four quadrants, over three of those quadrants have to be obliterated before flow is actually diminished. So if we can open up an artery so that it's narrowed less than 75% in cross-sectional area, that flow through that artery uh, should be normal. It, it should be just as if there was no atherosclerotic factor at all. So there's hope in this condition, even in people who have symptomatic uh, atherosclerotic disease. I'll also show that slide to point out that in the 1970s, the emphasis in cardiology was on blood pressure. In 1972, for example, only 15% of the population who had high blood pressure was having it adequately controlled. Today, 1989, 60% of hypertensions in America are having that blood pressure control. And stroke in this country has fallen about 60%. Stroke is primarily a hypertensive disorder. And now we're in this cholesterol era, and I like to think the 1990s of uh, reversibility uh, may uh, come into prominence. Now, the best way to start lowering one's cholesterol level is by diet, of course. And the thing one wants to know about a food is the percent of calories in a particular food. For example, milk is advertised. Low-fat milk, 2% milk. Now, 2% sounds like not much fat at all. But that's 2% by weight because milk is 87% water and the fat lighter than water floats to the top. But 2% milk, low fat milk, as a percent of calories is 33% fat as a percent of calories. Whole milk is only 4 to 4.5% 4 
fat by weight, but whole milk is 50% fat as a percent of calories. Uh, so skim milk is the only good milk. Now the urge now is to get our fat as a percent of calories down from a 40 to 42 percent uh, to at least 30 percent. I say to at least 20 percent, and then our health would really skyrocket. Now some of you have seen these ads for fish tablets. Uh, it is true that some of these fish tablets work. I was involved with a little study at NIH who took these things. And it lowers our triglyceride levels and some of our uh, cholesterol levels, actually. The problem is you have to take one of those tablets every 15 minutes. <laughs> and some of, them, some of them have 40 calories in those little tablets, so this is not a good <laughs> Now, the pharmaceutical industry is really coming up with some good drugs. Uh, these are the drugs presently available in the USA. I think this list is going to double within the next three years, and within the next ten years, it'll probably uh, quadruple uh, this. Uh, the new, newest player here is a drug called Lovastatin, and it, this, is, this is a very interesting drug because it only came out in September 1987. September 1987. And over one million Americans are on this drug. And the reason is because, number one, it's very effective in lowering our cholesterol levels. And number two, it, it, it has really no significant toxic effects. Uh, in about one out of a thousand people it does, but that's all. And it's easy to take. It's just one tablet at supper time. So I think this drug is going to have a major effect. Some of the other drugs are also very good. Niacin, nicotinic acid, vitamin, is a wonderful drug. Uh, it's cheap. <coughs> you can take, uh, take 1.8 grams of that for a whole year, and it costs you $30. Whereas every one of these tablets will cost you $1.50. Dollar, a dollar but the point is, is that the drugs are going to be good now. But the drugs are not so good unless uh, unless one follows a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet at the same time, because the two work uh, synergistically. The thing about these low-cholesterol drugs is just like the antihypertensive drugs, once you start taking them, you've got to take them for a lifetime. Here's this lovastatin drug, for example. Uh, this is a single patient. The total cholesterol level was about 310, this patient took four tablets a day, 80 milligrams. Boom! <coughs> cholesterol level fell to just over 200. Then the patient was taken off the medicine. Boom! It went right back up. So it's, it's a lifetime type of drug. In America, about 25% uh, of the population have total cholesterol is over 240. Now, most authorities in America suggest that we not treat uh, by drugs anybody's total cholesterol unless it's over uh, 260 or uh, in that uh, range. But only 5% of Americans have total cholesterol over 265. And most people with heart attacks have total cholesterol levels between 200 and 240. I was at a, a party a few years ago in Washington, and there was a senator there. I don't know if any those type parties. But this uh, host this, uh, said, well, I have a doctor over there, something. So he came over and he said, uh, he said, doctor, I'm so happy. He said, I went to my doctor today and my total cholesterol level is only 225. He said, isn't that wonderful? And I said something to the fact that yes. But what I really wanted to tell him was, it sounded good. Do you know what the average total cholesterol level is of people in coronary care units around the country who have heart attacks? And the average is 225. So he was right on the button. And sure enough, two years later, that's what he had. Now, what I've talked about is cholesterol. Yeah, that means focusing. And that's the major risk factor. Uh, but men have more heart disease than, than women. One of the reasons, I think, is that men's cholesterol levels are higher over a longer period of time. In the last 20 years of life, as a rule, 
if men survive a little longer, women have higher levels than men after age 70. But by that time, most men are gone. The tragedy, the tragedy of coronary disease is that the average age of death in men is 6, 0, 60 years of age. The average age of a woman is 68. Whereas the usual longevity of a woman, and a white woman at least, in this country is now 78 years. So coronary disease kills relatively young. And most of these things uh, take care of themselves if we take care of our cholesterol. Now let me end this with a note on hypertension. This is Franklin Roosevelt. And when he took office in March 1933, his blood pressure was 120 over 80. You can see what the office did to him. A month before he died, look at that blood pressure. 300 over 190. It blew his head off. And uh, in 1945, the point of this is that we had no therapy for systemic hypertension in this country in 1945. And in the past 50 years, the pharmaceutical industry has come up with oodles of wonderful drugs to treat systemic hypertension. So this is a problem now that is being pretty well controlled. I can also tell you that Richard Nixon, when he entered office in January 1969, had a blood pressure of 110 over 70. And when he left office under some relatively undue circumstances in Early 1974, his blood pressure was 110 over 70. Now you can conclude what you wish. Cultures <laughs> whose diets are low in sodium and high in potassium are normal tensity. That means they have a normal blood pressure. When people from these above cultures adopt a Western lifestyle, their blood pressure then rises with age and the frequency of hypertension explodes. We say in this country that it's normal for blood pressure to go up with age. It's normal for cholesterol levels to go up with age. That's just the way we do it. But that's not the way it ought to be. It's not normal for either to go up with age. But we are diminishing the amount of salt we take in. And the more salt, less salt we take in, the better off we are. Don't even have a salt shaker on your table. It's not impolite to say, please pass the pepper. I mean, you don't have to. I grew up, you had to pass them both together. Uh, but that's, we should throw away that salt. I used to pour, when I would eat, I would pour salt all over my food and then eat it. And all of a sudden I quit. And there's no added salt. The processed food's got so much salt in it anyway, uh, it's, it's a joke. But once one gets used to not so much salt, it's, it's okay. Let me end this with the anthropologists. At least three fellows over here are anthropologists. They wrote a book called The Paleolithic Prescription, published in March 1980, I mean, June 1988. It's a wonderful book. But they went to Africa to study the Bush people. And they believed that the Bush people lived like the our Stone Age ancestors many, many thousands of years ago. And these are some of their conclusions. Many diseases in the late 20th century USA were uncommon, rare, or non-existent among our Stone Age ancestors. Our genes have not changed since anatomically modern humans became widespread about 35,000 years ago. Now, 35,000 years ago is not very long. Uh, the planet's been here 4.6 billion years. Dinosaurs are on the planet, apparently, 150 million years. And we've been here as we are now, 35,000 years ago. Or from a genetic standpoint, current humans are still late Paleolithic, pre-agricultural hunter gatherers. Therefore, we got a mismatch on our hands. In contrast to our genes, our culture, of course, has changed enormously, beginning with the agricultural revolution about 5,000 years ago. Before that time, our human beings did not drink milk or eat butter, and accelerating since the Industrial Revolution 200, 250 years ago. In other words, we have Stone Age bodies in anatomic age. 
Our remote ancestors had little or no exposure to either tobacco or alcohol. Their lives required both aerobic and resistance exercise, and their nutrition was derived almost exclusively from wild game and uncultivated vegetable food. Obesity, diabetes, hypertension, atherosclerosis, and the most frequent cancers, lung, breast, colon, are diseases resulting from our current genetic lifestyle mismatch. The present societies who do not develop atherosclerosis, and there's still a few on the planet, live like our Paleolithic ancestors. They have low blood cholesterol levels, no hypertension, they do plenty of physical exertion, they do not use tobacco, and their diets are low in total fat and have more polyunsaturated than saturated fatty acids. Their blood is even thinner than ours. I think uh, many of us in the state say that our greatest risk factor of atherosclerosis is aging. Older people have more atherosclerosis than younger people, but it doesn't have to be so. These are coronary arteries, those that confuse the heart muscle, at sites of maximal narrowing in a woman 103 years of age. Now that's the left main coronary artery. It's perfect. I'll trade with her right now. This is the right coronary artery. That's the biggest plaque she had in her body. This is the left anterior descending, the one that's in the front of the heart. Just perfect. 103 years old. Poor lady was run over by an automobile. <laughs> I say Mark Twain is right. He said, he said, the only way to keep healthy is to eat what you don't want, drink what you don't like, and do what you'd rather not. <laughs>
and it's proven in the last three years uh, among physicians at least, and it's debatable whether they are normal or abnormal. <laughs> at least, but among these were the people studied. Those that took aspirin over a three-year period clearly had a lower frequency of heart attacks than those who didn't. And these were age to match people. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's a very useful thing. Uh, probably one aspirin tablet a day beginning uh, in men, about age 35, in women about 50. Well, that's a debatable issue at the moment. Um, uh, the, the present recommendation by one uh, expert panel, uh, adult committee is that nobody go on drugs uh, who has not been on a lipid lowering diet for at least six months to see what effect the diet will have. Uh, on the lipid levels, uh, which I think is a fine recommendation for people who never had a heart attack. And my disagreement comes in the, in the people who had heart attacks. My own view is, is that if one has had a heart attack or a bypass operation or angioplasty or angiopectus and, and has confirmed coronary narrowing by angioplasty, I think these people should be started on lipid lowering drug therapy simultaneously with diet therapy. Now that's uh, at variance with the medical uh, community in general recommendation. But we spent in this country in 1988 about $8 billion for bypass operations. We spent about $2.5 billion for coronary angioplasty. Uh, and we spent uh, chicken feed in comparison for liquid lowering drugs. Now, I don't have any interest uh, personally in the pharmaceutical industry, but if, we, if, if everybody who had a heart attack in this country, and there have been about five, four, there are about uh, approximately six million Americans alive who had a heart attack, if every one of them were taking one tablet of lovastatin, that would be a $2 billion bill a year. Now, I think that would, on a whole population basis, have a considerable impact. But these drugs do not work very well unless the person <coughs> pays attention to diet, because they both work the same way. What effect does stress have on the atherosclerosis and clinical cholesterol? What is stress? Psychological stress, just like Oh, I don't know. I don't know what stress is. Uh, 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 I heard a tennis player a while back say that if I have to play in another tennis tournament next week, I'm going to go out of my mind. Well, I like a little of that stress. Uh, what is stressful to one person is not stressful to another. Now, there are certain things in life that stress me. Giving a talk does not. I think it, that is stressful to somebody else. So measuring stress is, 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 is a joke. I think life is a stress. Uh, I've testified in court a couple of times about stress. It's impossible to deal with it. There's no, there's no existence without stress. How do you want to define it? Yes. You comment on the recent article in the Atlantic Monthly about the legal was about the uh, seem to contradict some of the things you said about cholesterol. Yes. Well, I, this is an article that appeared in the Atlantic Monthly magazine in September of this year. It was 25 pages long. I've never seen an article in a magazine by a single author 25 pages long. But this uh, uh, writer, uh, the title of the article says it all, uh, the cholesterol myth. But what he does is simply uh, pick out 
some of the studies showing a relationship between cholesterol and atherosclerosis and say that none of them are any good. And in actuality, he took 50 years of work and said all of these are junk. Now, I think, uh, you know, to be frank with you, it's sensationalism. Uh, for example, he didn't mention, for example, uh, that an easy way to produce atherosclerosis is just give an animal cholesterol or fat. And if you give a rabbit or certain other animals, monkeys, human beings, cholesterol or fat, they can develop atherosclerosis. Um, he was selected. He mentioned the Lipid Research Clinic study at length, but the Helsinki Heart Study was almost uh, discarded, uh, whereas I think that's a major study. The epidemiologic studies from around the world dis dismissed them as epidemiologic studies. Uh, you can't uh, draw conclusions from them. Well, I think that's uh, I think that this is a situation where a magazine is in trouble and somebody wants to make money. Now this chapter was a, I mean, this article was a chapter in his book entitled Heart Faith. And since that magazine article came out, he's been on television in about 10 different shows. Uh, Atlantic Monthly is in trouble. And this article came out in Washington, D.C. within three or four days. You couldn't find that magazine a single store in Washington, D.C. Uh, so, so I'm not, I think it's been a disservice. Uh, we all want to hear that, that eating a 16-ounce steak is not bad for you. <laughs> the milk industry, the beef industry, you know, they have millions a year to spend for this kind of to, to spend advertising their products. <coughs> Delighted, I'm sure, with an article like this. I, I'm a little bit uh, concerned. Uh, how do we, uh, the graphs are very nice and the data is very nice, uh, with an increased intake in the saturated fats, and you say that increases the cholesterol, uh, probably with your body synthesis, how does the body move the pathway to see? Oh, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> But I think the message now needs to be gotten across to the human beings in a simplistic fashion so we can, uh, we, we can understand it and not be confused by some of the complexities of it. Uh, so I'm not the right one to go into that. That may well be the case. <coughs> I don't have any problem with that. Whether it's the cause of the indicator, it's the same. So the, the, uh, the fat is a major problem. You may be in trouble right there. I don't think anybody can share those answers to that. Uh, you said that as a Well, it's my understanding that pure vegetarians over a long, long time, their cholesterol doesn't necessarily go up with age. See, the problem with obesity is that you know, the reason most of us weigh too much is that we eat too much fat. Now, a gram of fat is nine calories. A gram of carbohydrate, a gram of protein is four calories. And, and 
the only way, if the only way to stay alive in a body weight is to decrease the amount of fat we take in, which leads to uh, the less plaque, atherosclerotic plaque, the less diabetes, the less cancer of the bone, the vicious cycle. We can continue with some questions at the reception uh, down in room 123. Uh, we have some light questions for those of you who like to ask.